When you're wading through the unknown, it can feel scary and risky. You float around wondering if you're going in the right direction and want to know what's next. Being lost is a collaboration between possibility and uncertainty. It's an excuse to get one step closer to a more fulfilling life. What you were comfortable with may not be there anymore, but you will have the remarkable opportunity to reconnect with yourself and embrace discovery. In these in-between moments, turn to your inner beacon and pay close attention to where it's guiding you. Your beacon is the light that blazes within you, a signal made up of your values, dreams, and priorities. The essayist Anais Nin put it best when she wrote, the unknown was my compass, the unknown was my encyclopedia, the unnamed was my science and progress. Shine your light, ask for help, and let go of the idea that you have to make a perfect choice. You may feel lost, but you are not alone. Our Milwaukee chapter chose this month's exploration of lost, and Melissa Lee Johnson illustrated the theme. On to our speaker. William Berg writes books and articles about Sacramento history. He is currently president of Preservation Sacramento and an Urban Hive member. His latest book is Wicked Sacramento, about the West End, Sacramento's lost neighborhood. The West End was a mixed-use, multiracial community of extraordinary diversity at the heart of downtown, demolished in the name of civic hygiene and higher real estate values. His talk will focus on young entrepreneurs who established creative businesses in the West End during the early 20th century. The stories of Sacramento's creative class of 1910 were lost for decades. William will demonstrate how their innovation can inspire businesses and community leaders a century later. William. Thank you. I, I, you have the mic. Got a mic. <laughs> All right. Well, as mentioned, uh, my talk is about the West End, which is a neighborhood that used to exist between California State Capitol and the Sacramento River. Really, there are maybe two or three buildings older than 1950 there today because it's, uh, it's gone. This is hidden history, lost history, and what I try to do is find the hidden stories. How many of you grew up in Sacramento? All right, so a lot of you may, if you, uh, went on those fourth grade field trips to Sutter's Fort and the Railroad Museum. What you learned was uh, a white guy built a fort, another white guy discovered gold, four white guys built a railroad, and nothing worth talking about has happened since 1869. Uh, the truth that I'm trying to find and others are trying to find is that our stories are much richer and much more diverse and much more interesting than that sudden ending, but they were buried. And these, these buildings were old, even in, in 1900, this was an old neighborhood. But uh, right, the writer Jane Jacobs said, uh, new ideas need old buildings. We are sitting in a perfect example of that concept. And the West End was filled with old buildings and new ideas. There were other new ideas, political ideas. In 1911, Sacramento adopted a new city charter called the Commission System to replace its old strong mayor system and that involved direct election of department heads and also came at the same time as the construction of what's now our historic city hall, but the time was the brand new city hall completed in 1911. One of the things that happened in 1911 in California is women got the right to vote. And the first woman elected to a city council in California, possibly the United States, was Luella Johnston. She uh, was born Luella Buckminster, born in 1861. She married a printer, Alfred Johnston, moved to Sacramento. Alfred died in 1906, but Luella was already becoming a powerhouse. In 1899, she joined a group called the Tuesday Literary Club, which is more kind of a book club, and turned it into a political organization before women had the right to vote. After she got the right to vote, she was the per first, woman, first person to file for election and was elected in 1912. Another member of the, the council at the time was Ed Carragher, who had been part of the previous administration and part of the Democratic Party power structure. He transitioned into the new era, which is called the Progressive Era, and was re-elected to council uh, under the new charter. But he was also a bar owner. He was part of the, the liquor interest in Sacramento, which many of the progressives, people like Luella Johnson, were interested in, li were interested in limiting. These were, this was the era when they were calling for prohibition of alcohol. 
Uh, the West End was also known, quite frankly, for sex work. And the best known of all of the, the, what was called a parlor house was the Cherry Club, which was owned by Cherry de St. Maurice. I don't know her real name. Cherry de St. Maurice is probably not her real name. But she was known throughout the city, fairly legendary. She came to Sacramento in 1903 as an, uh, as an actress, uh, worked in a uh, brothel on 2nd Street, and then started her own business in 1907, the Cherry Club. It was known as a fairly elegant place. It, in addition to the obvious business going on upstairs, she had a parlor lined with books on subjects ranging from philosophy to engineering and tried to foster discussions in the parlor between the, the, the patrons, uh, again, in between the, uh, the obvious business going on upstairs. We don't know a whole lot about her personal life, but she did, you see that life-size doll there, she used to cradle it like her own child, suggesting that she may have lost a child earlier in life. The location, location where she built her business was 327 L Street. If you know where the Macy's is downtown, it's right there on that block. Now, she also uh, was involved in, in local politics to an extent in that there, there was, at the time, a tolerated zone of sex work along 2nd Street and L Street known as the Tenderloin. And uh, it was semi-legal, and one of her big missions in life was to make life safer for the women who worked in this district because at the time it was just barely legal and she wanted to reinforce their safety. So she would occasionally would go do things like, that's Hiram Johnson who was the governor of California in 1910. She would occasionally stomp down the street to the state capitol because she was only seven blocks away, march into her, his office and say, look, the legislators in California are trying to ban red light districts during the day and at night they're in my club. You hypocrites, when are you, when you going to make sure that women in my profession are safe? She also diversified her business. One of the places that she bought was a nightclub down... There's actually a place called Oak Hall Bend in the Sacramento River near off, off of Riverside Road, and that's where the Oak Hall nightclub was. It had, was already existed nightclub owned by this fellow John Francisco, but he badly burned himself, ran into financial trouble, and she, Cherry bailed him out by buying the business. They later got into a legal dispute. Uh, apparently mixing romance and business did not work very well in this in instance, but, the, but Oak Hall became part of a large portfolio of businesses and of properties. She made land investments in North Sacramento and even in South Lake Tahoe. Tragically, in 1913, she was murdered, and the story of her murder and the pro prosecution of those accused is in my book. Now, the thing about Cherry de St. Maurice, like I said, this is not a profession that people like wanted to talk about or take credit for, and still isn't. It's still a, an area of a great deal of political and social controversy, but the issues that she addressed at the time were real. This was an, an era of just the beginning of what later became the women's liberation movement, of the women's movement. Women had just gotten the right to vote. And so Luella Johnston and Cherry de St. Maurice were two sides of the same coin, one on either side of the law, but both advocating in their own ways for women rights and women's rights and their right to take their place in society, which was just starting. And true to her prediction, after her murder, the city of Sacramento cracked down on prostitution. The result was that a lot of the places that had been run by women were now run by men, like Joe Fusky. Uh, Joe Fusky was an Italian immigrant. He became almost a walking stereotype for the concern about swarthy Southern European men, like myself, who would drag young innocent women into lives of vice, lives of vice and degradation. He also kind of had a sense of humor, though. Once he was arrested for fighting with a guy, and they were taken, the bail was $10, he put out 10 bucks and slapped it on the table, and then the guy he was fighting with was obviously broke, so I said, hey, I got you covered too, and slapped down $10 for him. Uh, interesting character, not a nice guy, but a very, very fascinating story. Uh, he also was essentially ejected from the United States uh, as a result of uh, uh, prosecution for pandering. <laughs> During this era, there was an act called the Mann Act. The idea was to prevent women from being 
transported across state lines for purposes, for immoral purposes, basically for sex work. But the second major prosecution took place here in Sacramento. These two gentlemen, Maury Diggs and De uh, Drew Caminetti, maybe gentlemen isn't the right the word. They, these guys were players. They were married men having affairs with two young women, and they went to spend a weekend in Reno, which crossed the state line. So both of them were prosecuted under the Mann Act for taking women across state lines for immoral purposes. They were both very well connected young men. Their, their fathers were both uh, former legislators who tried to bury the whole story, but it became a huge controversy. There were also women during this era. This is Daisy Simpson. She was born in 1890. She was a wild child, uh, was a drug addict in San Francisco, became, went into recovery, and became uh, part of what was called the special investigator. She was a special investigator. She actually would infiltrate brothels in order to bust them. And she was a master of disguise, went into multiple places in the same neighborhood and, were, and busted them. And when Prohibition started, she did the same thing with speakeasies. She actually had a fairly uh, dramatic reputation, completely fearless, involved in several gunfights. But over time, uh, she relapsed. Drug addiction caught up with her and she ended up having to leave service. But she ended up retiring and uh, managing a mobile home park in the, in the North Bay. <laughs> So she decided, okay, I've had enough excitement for the rest of my life. I'm going to settle down. Now, Sacramento also had a rich and diverse community. The African-American community dated back to the gold rush. This is Reverend J. Gordon McPherson. He was minister at St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal, which is the first black congregation on the West Coast, and he was also the founder of Sacramento's first black newspaper, the Sacramento Forum. And he's one of three black journalists during this decade who were doing the same sort of thing that Luella Johnston and Cherry de Saint Maurice were doing, advocating for the rights of their community and for civil rights in an era of increasing racism and prejudice. Uh, this is Reverend J. Gordon McPherson, who founded the third black newspaper, the Western Review, in 1915. The second wasn't a reverend, he was an attorney, P.J. Clyde Randall, who started the Sacramento Enterprise in 1910 and also wrote guest editorials about Sacramento's black community for the Sacramento Union. Uh, one of the other people that I'd really like to, uh, I'm going to talk about next, Captain Robert Fletcher. I don't have a photo of him, which is terrible because this guy had an incredibly exciting life. Uh, he was born in 1844 in New York. He grew up in the, the island of St. Thomas, didn't realize he was American until during the American Civil War. He said, I'm gonna fight for my country, uh, African-American man, this is a fight to, to release slaves. And so he came back, joined the Navy. After he was in the Navy, he served as a nurse in Panama and Tobago, came to Sacramento in 1869, and joined the Sacramento Zouaves, a black para paramilitary force, and married. He became captain of the Zouaves too. Um, then, uh, jumping to the 21st century, this is Grant Cross, a.k.a. Skewball, born in Illinois, my home state, came to Sacramento in 1901 from Red Bluff. He moved to the big city with his new wife, Rose, and he was mostly mentioned as, as a bartender or a, a waiter, but everybody in town knew him. He was a great communicator, had enormous connector skills, and he and his friend William Snow started a club called the West End Club. And the West End Club, so far as you know, is what gave the West End neighborhood its name. It was attended as an African-American social club. This is the only photo of William Snow I was able to find. Professional gambler, strong silent type. He was arrested at one point because he shot a guy in the, the pool hall that he managed because the guy was throwing pool balls at everybody. He was about to throw one at Snow and Snow went bang. Actually, he dropped, the guy dropped the charges because it did calm him down. The West End Club was intended as a social club for African-American men in the same way that the Sutter Club was a social club for white men, a way to, to do business connections, but also political organizing. Both were members of the Republican Party, and they were both nightclub entrepreneurs. One of their first clubhouses was this building, the Sarah Hall, located at 6th and L Street, so right where the arena is now. It was originally a church, and it was used by the Slavonian community, uh, those immigrants from Cro Croatia, and African Americans. And it became controversial because they were playing this new music that would later be known as jazz, and people really, young people really loved it, including young white women. That drew a lot of negative attention to the club. The same thing happened at their next clubhouse, John Churchill's Churchill Dance Hall, located at 424 M Street, now in the middle of Capitol Avenue. 
Churchill's Hall was also a polling place, and one of the things the West End Club did is they advocated to local electeds and to local political candidates to keep the polling place there because the Women's Christian Temperance Union wanted to remove the polling place from this neighborhood, which meant the people of the West End, the people of color, would no longer have a polling place in their own neighborhood, and they would have to go to a white neighborhood where they were most definitely not welcome in 1914 to vote, and so they, were, they wanted to call for their own rights. The next clubhouse they had was the Nippon Theater, which was a, across from the Cherry Club at 4th and L Street, founded in 1908 by Yusuke Nishio. Uh, they became the West End Club's clubhouse upstairs, and downstairs was a movie theater that was also used for kendo and jujitsu matches. Now, Yusuke Nishio was an entrepreneur as well, also with multiple businesses, after he opened the theater, he opened a restaurant. He came to Sacramento in 1906 after the San Francisco earthquake, and, and it, the restaurant was called Wakano Ura, named after a beautiful garden in Japan. And his innovation was that nobody knew what Japanese food was, at least Westerners didn't, in Sacramento in 1921. So he hired a Chinese cook because Chinese food was popular, and he had both Chinese and Japanese items. So he said, well, if you like the chow mein, you'll like the sukiyaki. And so he introduced Japanese food to Western palates in Sacramento. He also, his, for, for the other palates, he, he, he had sake, and his wife used to smuggle sake to the restaurant in a baby carriage. <laughs> and the, there was actually a, a bootleg sake operation on rice farms in the Delta that brought their sake up to Sacramento and into the, because the, <clears throat> sorry. Reverend T. Allen Harvey came to Sacramento in 1916 and did a lot. He founded the AME Zion Church, the first black church in a Sacramento suburb, Oak Park. He founded the Sacramento NAACP. He won the city's first discrimination case after being refused service at the Bigelow Restaurant on 35th Street. And he was the first African American to run for office in Sacramento in 1919 and 1921. He did not win, but he damn well tried. And he said that I'm not going to come in last, and he didn't. He came in fifth out of seventh. He also started, uh, he was a Spanish-American war veteran. He started a group for veterans. He spoke to veteran, his, veterans and soldiers going to and from the World War I. And in 1919, during the Red Summer, which was a series of lynchings throughout the, throughout the United States, extraordinarily bloody and brutal, started this organization, the Christmas Addict Soldiers and Sailors Club of veterans, deciding if things get really hairy, we're going to have to arm ourselves and defend ourselves, the same way that the Sacramento Zouaves had done 50 years before, in order to ensure the safety and well being, so a political organizer, but also a fighter. Another fighter was Ansel Hoffman. He was another, another uh, fellow born in Illinois, like myself. He came to Sacramento as a young boy, and when he was a kid, he used to make money by picking up chunks of ice from the Southern Pacific yards where they dumped the ice out of the refrigerator cars and selling it to bars, at least until they figured out where the ice was coming from. <laughs> He's also a baseball fan. He played, when he was a kid, he played against a women's baseball team called the, the Bloomer Girls. Later in life, he actually worked with the Boston Bloomer Girls as their equipment manager. And because he was five foot one, 110 pounds soaking wet, at one point when the third base player got, si got sick, they had Ansel put on a red wig and play baseball in drag. <laughs> he actually came back to Sacramento and became a, a boxer, but there wasn't much money in boxing, and so he went into his family's business of running saloons. His first bar was at 18th and, 18th and M Street, 18th and Capitol. His second and third were the Schlitz Cafe at 708 K Street. There's about to be a Devil May Care ice cream opening the same location, and a place that was originally called the Hofbrau, but with the outbreak of World War I, he renamed it the All-American Cafe. <laughs> It's also the first documented place in the, Sacramento, in the Sacramento Union where they advertised jazz as being played. Jazz was already here. The West End Club brought it here a few years earlier, but Ansel Hoffman, as a white man, was more successfully able to promote that to a white audience. He also became a boxing manager. His first boxer was George Washington Lee, who uh, his uh, mother's Mexican, his father was Chinese, also moved here in 1906 after the earthquake. Uh, 
about the same size as Ansel, not a big guy, but with a serious attitude who punched way above his weight class. They toured around the country and actually around the world, and he had to have this note written in order to get back into the United States to demonstrate that he was a U.S. citizen. This, uh, the United States immigration laws at the time were ridiculously strict, especially when it came to immigration from China. So he had to have a note like this in order to get back in. Now, his style was praised by legendary gentleman Jim Braddock. He was willing to take on heavier fighters, but as a result, he had a middling fight record. He lost to a fighter named Pancho Villa for the world, or Francisco Galeto, for the World Bantamweight Championship in Manila. And he fought Galeto again here in Sacramento in 1924 to an overcapacity crowd, mostly of Filipino farm workers who came to see Galeto. Now, Lee retired in 1927 to work at the state printing plant, but he also became a boxing manager. Now, where they fought in Sacramento was called the L Street Arena of Boxing. It was located on 2nd and L Street, underneath I-5 now. And in 1924, Ansel Hoffman and his business partner, Fred Bataro, were arrested for violation of liquor laws. This is during Prohibition. And uh, he was arraigned, never showed up for the arraignment, and they dismissed the, ch the charges because, well, he's not here. This is obviously a guy who had political connections. Um, so he went on to manage Max and Buddy Bear. Now, this guy, I don't think he's that admiral, but he's interesting. This is Big Nick Matkovich, who emigrated from Croatia in 1916. He opened a hotel and labor agency for Filipino migrant workers. Started a controversy when he opened what was called a taxi dance hall for his Filipino migrant workers, but the dancers were white. Uh, crossing racial lines was a good way to get the, the city council upset, and that's what he did. And he was no civil rights advocate, had zero respect for women. I think he was just really, really, really stubborn. In one case, uh, there was a, a, a suit brought against him in 1939 because taxi dancers, now this is a business where you buy a ticket for 10 cents and you give it to a woman to dance with for one minute and she keeps five cents. They were supposed to get unemployment insurance, but uh, when they tried to file after, after leaving the business, he claimed, oh, they're independent contractors. It's kind of like the gig economy. It took six years, but they actually won the suit against him and got unemployment insur insurance for, uh, for their time as taxi dancers. Uh, George Dunlap, another native Sacramento, born in 1884, was a Sacramento native. His father was a member of the Sacramento Zoos, part of the African-American community. He left school after fourth grade to take care of his family, cooking and working at a Chinese farmer's market. And he worked for Southern Pacific in their dining car department, cooking on Southern Pacific trains. His first restaurant opened in 1917 at 621 J Street. This is his second at 7th and K Street, right on the edge of downtown Commons, if you know where that is. He, um, in 1919, he was arrested for smuggling whiskey into Washington because at the time, Washington was a dry state, California was not, and he brought on hay bales into the dining car filled with whiskey bottles and dropped them off in Washington. He was acquitted because the arraignment document said that he had smuggled it into Oregon, wrong state, so bad paperwork meant that he didn't get prosecuted. <laughs> but that became the end of his time with Southern Pacific, and there was an old saying with lo of lo old time railroad guys, you get fired from Southern Pacific, you work for Union Pacific, or Western Pacific, you get fired from Western Pacific, you work for Sacramento Northern. George, the Sacramento Northern was an interurban railroad that ran between Chico and Sacramento and Oakland, and George got the contract to run all the dining cars on Sacramento Northern's electric trains, including the ferry that they used, the Ramon, crossing Sassoon Bay. This lasted about five years until 1927 when Western Pacific bought Sacramento Northern, and they wanted to have their own dining contractor. So they wrote up actually what I think are fake reviews. There's a, like Yelp reviews about it to get him fired from the job. So he said, the hell with it. I've got this beautiful house in Oak Park. I've got these beautiful daughters who don't mind working for me because they already did at the state fair. So I'm going to open Dunlap's dining room. That became his lasting legacy. And if anybody goes to the Sacramento History Museum, they can still see a display of Dunlap's dining room as one of the, the city's legacy African-American businesses. So that's, that and more are in my new book as well as some of my other books. And hopefully this has just been a taste of Sacramento's lost neighborhood and its businesses. Thank you. <laughs>